six years imitating Simon and Kirby art on Captain America, imitating the crude work which Simon and Kirby had improved upon since then. That same night, as Captain America once again becomes Steve Rogers, he recalls his deadliest enemy many years ago. And as he tries to sleep, he cannot forget the most hated, the most fiendish face of all, the Red Skull. You fool! The final battle has not been fought. The fruits of victory shall be mine. Then, in his memory, Steve Rogers returns to the fateful day 20 years before when he fought his last battle in the Red Skull's hidden bunker. Destroy him! Don't let him get away! He can't escape me now. Not when I've come so close. Stop him, you fools! Cursed shield! Bullets have no effect on it! You will never win! You cannot destroy my plan! This will do it! I'll finish you off with a simple hand grenade! I've got to stop him from throwing that grenade. Captain America was designed to be sort of a wish fulfillment of the guy who wants to go fight in the war, you know, I don't want to be just a foot soldier. I want to be the guy parachuting into Germany, beating the hell out of the stormtroopers, and then going on and, you know, grabbing Hitler. Uh, so he definitely was, you know, like a living icon or an extension of patriotic spirit at the time. I thought that we should have a villain. The villains were very popular at the time. Bob Kane had some very good villains in his Batman comic. So... I thought possibly we could have a live villain, a real villain, and I thought who was the most hated man in the West, and that would be Adolf Hitler. So actually, Captain America started off uh, with Hitler for uh, a villain. We put a uh, decided comical bend to it, and um, Captain America turned out to be a foil for Adolf Hitler. Back in the 40s, when most of the characters were invented, you've got the fact that here's a real-world villain that we can go ahead and caricaturize, and we can put in these comics, and we can have characters like Green Lantern and the Spectre literally going out there and punching Hitler and fighting specific costumed soldiers from a very specific nation and be completely unhinged about it. They would put out books uh, using the characters um, selling them against the Germans, against the... Selling war bonds, actually. They used the characters for that purpose. That I definitely knew they did that. You know? And apparently they were successful, because they did quite a bit of that. In fact, I remember there'd be one with Superman with, his, with a bird on his arm. You remember? Buy war bonds. You know? So they did a lot of work for the government. was not so much to save the world as it was patriotism. We were in a war. Uh, the Army and the Navy were involved, boys and 
sons and daughters and uh, fathers were all involved in this. And so putting the superhero into these stories meant that we would be saving not the world, but saving our own. And I think that was the main effect. That's the way it struck me anyhow. The comic industry uh, in the 40s had the World War II impetus. And uh, there was a common enemy in the world and uh, all the superheroes uh, banded together to fight uh, uh, Nazi Germany. Uh, in the 50s, we were criticized. The comic industry got a lot of criticism because of uh, what they thought was over-nationalist over uh, zeal in, in the communist uh, villains. We called them the Red Menace. And uh, that was all because of uh, Senator Joe McCarthy's uh, uh, fight against uh, in Congress against uh, the Red Menace, against the Communists, uh, uh, red under every bed. I'd rather be uh, dead than red. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we thought that they were going to be the new villains in America for the patriotic heroes to, 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 to combat. number of scholars who talk about the Cold War entering the American psyche in uh, subterranean ways. There's a whole literature about the horror films of the 1950s uh, being a code for being taken over by the Red Menace. There are all these attacks from another planet or the thing from outer space, or the classic is the invasion of the body snatchers, where uh, good American citizens, their minds are taken over by these aliens. And it's clearly a metaphor for at what was the called communist brainwashing. You remember when the Americans attacked communists? That was so much fun. Uh, we also attacked comic books. Somehow there was a relationship made between comic books and crime and comic books and going against authority and comic books and, and violence. There was a senator here named Keith Alpha who was wanted to be president. He needed a theme to jump off from and he picked on comics. I think the way they're picking on films today and uh, the violence, violence hurting children, you know, and they blame all the comics for the problem. We were attacked all over, on radio, papers, newspapers, everyone was attacking us. And this guy, Keith Farfel, was saying children are being killed by comic books and so on and so forth. So it was a really desperate time. There were about 422 different comics or comic titles on the newsstands in March 1954. Of these, about one-fourth were of the crime and horror uh, variety. To what extent, in other words, do these appeal to the children to a greater or less degree than uh, the kind that we're all more familiar with, the, the harmless comic strip? It's it was about 20 million a month, uh, Senator Keith Hall. That's right, said. 20 million a month of, of, uh, of this, uh, the crime and horror variety. Uh, there's a particular psychologist, Dr. Frederick Wortham, wrote a book published in 1954, The Seduction of the Innocent, where he used psychoanalytic theory to talk about how comic books were corrupting young minds and all, all, all the violence, and he argued that Batman and Robin were living out a homosexual fantasy, and he had all these theories about how corrupting comic books were. They were the marijuana of the nursery. And they really instilled fear right across the country, and distributors were throwing comic books out of their places, and we didn't think the business was going to survive anymore. So the publishers at that point got together, and they decided to build a code a self-controlling code. And they thought that would appease the crowd. And they would go over every page and they'd take things out. We thought we were irresponsible, they didn't care. We had to follow the code rules and we would do it. And uh, we couldn't show blood of any kind. Uh, 
the sex, you had to be very careful with sex. And uh, the crimes had to be very low-key crimes, you know, would be a, a, a robbery. And you had to be careful showing gun, guns, what you did with the guns. At that time, the comic books were so set upon, so attacked for the material that they were doing, right or wrong, they were attacked for that kind of material that uh, it affected everyone. It affected the publishers, it affected the distributors, it affected everyone up and down the line. And so if that comic code emblem was not on the book, the book did not get distributed. The comic book industry was floundering, waiting for some sort of trend. Uh, DC Comics started a book called Showcase, which was intended to try out new ideas. And the subtext of having a comic like that was, we don't know what to publish. And they tried a little bit of everything. They did comic books about TV stars. They did cartoony things. They, they tried a little bit of everything, waiting for something to click and show them the new direction.